Hello friends. So in uh, pre completed uh, the principle of uh, three phase induction motor, and uh, then uh, we have seen the effect of uh, uh, slip on various parameters. So we have started with the effect of slip on rotor frequency. Now. Uh, we uh, know that the speed of uh, rotating magnetic field it is given by n is equal to 120 f by p, where f is the frequency of supply in hertz and p are the number of poles of stator as well as rotor. Now the induced EMF on the rotor that depends on the rate of cutting flux in the uh, that is the relative speed because at start when n equal to 0 slip is equal to 1 and the stationary rotor has the maximum relative motion with respect to rmf hence maximum emf gets in induced in the rotor at start and the frequency of this induced emf at start is same as that of the supply frequency now actually as rotor uh, rotates with the speed n that is the actual speed. The relative speed of rotor with respect to RMF decreases after the motor has started and motor is in running condition. And the speed will become now the slip speed. That is NS minus N. So that is the slip speed and that is the uh, relative speed between the RMF and the rotor. Now, if the uh, this uh, um, rotor frequency if it is FR uh, the, uh, that is the rotor uh, induced EMF in the rotor the frequency is FR and the uh, slip speed is NS minus N then uh, there must exist a relation between NS minus N FR and P similar to NS F and P so NS minus N is equal to 120 fr by p where p is the number of rotor and stator poles and fr is the uh, frequency of uh, rotor emf under running condition and the relative motion between the rotor and uh, rmf that is ns minus n now take uh, ratio of these two equations ns minus n and ns so we'll get ns minus n upon ns equal to 120 fr by p divided by 120 f by p so that is nothing but fr by pf so uh, now ns minus n upon ns is nothing but slip s so s is equal to fr by f therefore fr is equal to s into f this is the relation between the rotor frequency under running condition and that is equal to s into f now we know that if we'll substitute the value of s as 1 because s is equal to 1 at start because uh, n is 0 so s will become equal to 1 so fr will be equal to f and under running condition we know that value of s is equal to 0 0.01 to 0 0.05 that is 1 percent to 5 percent so that's why fr will be very very small because f into this point one not one or point not five so that is very very small value will be getting so thus the effect of slip on rotor frequency is rotor frequency is multiply rotor frequency at under running condition that is equal to s times that is slip times the frequency of rotor at uh, frequency of the supply you can say so at standstill s equal to 1 so fr will become f okay now let us see the effect of this slip 
on the magnitude of rotor induced emf so emf induced in the rotor it is equal to say e2 so e2 is the rotor induced emf per phase at standstill condition and under running condition this will become e2r so e2r is the rotor induced emf per phase under running condition so the e2r value it is given as e2r is equal to s times e2 that is the magnitude of induced emf in the rotor is also reducing by the slip times the magnitude of induced emf at standstill condition because at standstill condition the value of s will become equal to 1 so e2r will be equal to e2 at start when the speed of the motor is zero and under running condition this slip value it will be reduced that's why the value of e2r that is the magnitude of rotor induced emf under running condition it will also reduce by the amount of slip okay then the effect on rotor reactance now we know that rotor wind rotor is made up of a winding so rotor winding is having its own resistance and reactance uh, that is the inductance so uh, say r2 is the rotor resistance per phase at standstill and x2 is the rotor reactance per phase at standstill then x2r x2r is the rotor reactance under running condition so that reactance is also multiplied by the slip so x2r is equal to s times x2 where x2r is the rotor reactance under running condition and x2 is the rotor reactance at standstill so this x2r is equal to s times x2 now this is the uh, reactance or uh, inductance that is uh, varying uh, depending on the slip but the rotor resistance that rotor resistance is independent of frequency so it will remain same under standstill condition as well as under running condition and rotor reactance it will decrease by the slip times the rotor reactance at standstill position okay so this is the effect of slip on the rotor reactance now what is the effect of slip on rotor impedance now let us say z2 is the rotor impedance at standstill position that is n equal to 0 and s equal to 1 so under this condition we can say this z2 which is made up of r uh, r2 and x2 so that is given by r2 plus jx2 ohm per phase so this is the rotor impedance at standstill condition now the magnitude of which how to find magnitude of this reactance we are finding it by it is under root of this square plus this square so r2 square under root of r2 square plus x2 square ohm per phase will be the magnitude of this impedance rotor impedance now this impedance is at standstill position now while z2r is the rotor impedance under running condition and under running condition it is given by r2 plus j x2r so r2 plus j x2r now r2 is independent of slip whereas x2r is depending on the slip so this x2r is nothing but your uh, we have already seen in previous this x2r is equal to s into x2 so from this you substitute here x2r as s into x2 so that is z2r is equal to r2 plus j times s x2 ohm per phase and its magnitude we can find it by under root of this r2 square plus s x2 square okay so z2r is equal to under root of r2 square plus s x2 whole square that is this is ohm per phase so this is the rotor impedance under running condition and this is rotor impedance and at standstill now what is the effect of slip on 
rotor power factor now we know that power factor how we are defining it it is the cos of phi 2 that is power factor where phi 2 is the angle between the e2 and i2 that is the induced emf uh, at rotor and the uh, current flowing through the rotor so the angle between these two it is phi 2 and cos of phi 2 is the power factor and generally the power factor is ratio of r divided by z so cos of phi 2 for ro for rotor side we are saying that's why it is 2 so suffix 2 so cos of phi 2 it is equal to r2 by z2 now for under standstill condition this r2 as it is irrespective of s it is uh, frequency independent so r2 will remain as it, it is r2 z2 will be um, at stand still it is irrespective of s so uh, r and x both the values so that's why this uh, magnitude of this z2 will become under root of r2 square plus x2 square so this is the value of power factor under stand still condition now under running condition this cos of phi 2 will become cos of phi 2r where phi 2r is the angle between uh, i 2r and uh, e 2r okay and it is given by ratio of r 2 upon z 2r this r 2 is irrespective of uh, frequency that's why it will remain as it is r 2 and z 2r it is depending on the value of slip because under running condition this z 2r depends on the slip so that's why the magnitude of this z 2r will be under root of r2 square plus s x2 square so this we have already seen in this equation so we have substituted the value of z 2r from this so z 2r is this so that's why cos of phi 2r is equal to r2 upon under root of r2 square plus s x2 square so this is the power factor under running condition okay so next is the effect of slip on the rotor current so uh, this say i2 is the again rotor current over phase at stand uh, standstill condition under standstill condition i2 is the current and the magnitude of i2 we know that depends on e2 and z2 so e2 is the uh, rotor um, emf or uh, induced emf across uh, rotor due to uh, means according to faraday's law of induction so e2 and z2 uh, so under uh, standstill condition this i2 will depend on e2 and z2 so i2 as we know uh, current i is ratio of voltage upon z impedance so e2 by z2 will be equal to i2 so i2 is equal to e2 per phase divided by z2 per phase ampere okay so e2 we know uh, it is e2 and z2 magnitude of z2 under standstill condition is r2 under root of r2 square plus x2 square so this is the value of the rotor current i2 under standstill condition that is e2 upon under root of r2 square plus x2 square amperes and if we want to find the value of rotor current under running condition so i2r let us say i2r is the rotor current per phase under running condition so i2r will be given by e2r upon z2r now e2r we have seen that e2r it is depending on s into e2 because uh, uh, that um, running condition emf that is dependent on the slip and this emf so e2r is equal to s times e2 and z2r again uh, its resistive component will not depend on slip but its uh, inductive component or reactive component will depend on slip so its magnitude is under root of r2 square plus s x2 square so i2r is equal to um, that is the uh, rotor current per phase under running condition that is given by s into e2 divided by under root of r2 square plus s x2 whole square okay so this is the effect of slip on 
rotor current so we have seen the effect of uh, um, uh, rotor current uh, uh, effect of slip on all these parameters at standstill position and at under running condition so in the value of under running condition if you will put value of slip s is equal to 1 because at start slip is 1 so it will give you all the values all the all the expressions at start so you can check here also if you will put s equal to 1 you will get this equation so under uh, at standstill condition and this is under running condition so you can check for all these cos of phi 2 r phi 2 substitute value of s equal to 1 you will get the value of this at standstill everywhere you will get the same results okay so i hope you have understood uh, what is the effect of slip on all these parameters so usually uh, numericals may be asked on this or uh, maybe uh, derivations uh, what is the effect of slip on these parameters that you have to explain okay then next point we'll cover is the torque equation so um, we know the torque produced in the induction motor it depends on three factors one is the part of rotating magnetic field which reacts with the rotor and that is responsible to produce the induced emf in the rotor so that is the phi then second component is the magnitude of rotor current under running condition that is i2 r and third factor is the power factor of the rotor circuit under running condition that is cos of phi 2 r therefore we can mathematically represent this relationship as torque is directly proportional to phi into i2 r into cos of phi 2 r where this phi is the part of rotating magnetic field which is which reacts with the rotor and which is responsible to produce the induced emf that is the flux responsible to produce induced emf is what i2 r is the rotating uh, rotor uh, current under running condition and cos of phi 2 r is the power factor uh, under Uh, rotor power factor under running condition so torque is directly proportional to phi into i2 r into cos of phi 2 r now we know that this flux produced by the stator which is proportional to e1 that is the uh, applied voltage across stator and uh, that's why we can write phi is directly proportional to e1 now e1 and e2 they are related to each other through a ratio of stator turns to rotor turns that is a constant that means the applied voltage across stator winding that is e1 and the induced voltage across rotor that is e2 so it is ratio uh, it is related by with a ratio of e2 by e1 which is equal to a constant value and that depends on the ratio of stator turns and rotor turns okay that means e2 since this is a constant value e2 by e1 is a constant value e2 is directly proportional to e1 that means uh, here we can substitute it e1 as e2 so e2 will be directly proportional to phi therefore e2 is directly proportional to phi so let us say this is equation number 2 now we know that i2 r we have seen the value of i2 r which is equal to e2 r upon here we have seen the value of i2 r what is that i2 r this i2 r it is equal to e2 r upon z2 r that is s e2 upon under root of r2 square plus s x2 whole square that is the rotor current under running condition and cos of phi 2 r that we have seen 
cos of pi to r it is r2 upon z to r that is equal to r2 upon under root of r2 square plus s x2 whole square so these two values we know from this rotor power factor under running condition and rotor current under running condition so you substitute the value of e2 uh, pi as e2 so here we can substitute pi as e2 as uh, pi is proportional to e2 i to r and cos of pi to r so these three values we can substitute this i to r and cos of pi to r i have again uh, rewritten over here so substituting these values equations 2 3 and 4 in equation 1 we get torque which is directly proportional to phi here we have substituted phi as e2 from equation 2 into i to r we have substituted the value of i to r from this equation 3 and into cos of pi to r we have substituted the value of cos of pi to r from equation number 4 so torque is proportional to this product of this three we have simplified this equation so that is equal uh, that is this torque is proportional to s times e2 square into r2 divided by this uh, multiplication of these two roots so roots will be cancelled so it is equal to r2 square plus s x2 whole square so this is if we we'll remove this proportionality sign so torque will be equal to k into s into e2 square into r2 divided by r2 square plus s x2 whole square newton meter so we have simply removed this proportionality sign and uh, put here a constant value and constant k and equal to sign okay now constant k is the uh, constant of proportionality and usually it is given by k is equal to 3 upon 2 pi ns where this ns is a small ns where this smallest small ns is the synchronous speed in rps revolutions per second whereas and it is given by capital ns upon 60 where this ns is the synchronous speed which is expressed in the terms of rpm revolutions per minute whereas this ns small ns it is represented in rps that's why uh, it is divided by rpm uh, speed in rpm ns divided by 60 and this ns you know it is equal to 120 f by p okay so this is the value of constant k now substitute the value of constant k here so that you will get the um, uh, equation for torque so torque is equal to 3 upon 2 pi small ns into s into e2 square into r2 divided by r2 square plus s into x2 whole square newton meter so this is the equation number 6 which is very important so you have to uh, remember this equation because numericals may be asked uh, directly to calculate the um, value of torque so the torque uh, developed at any load condition can be obtained Uh, if slip at that particular uh, load is known to you and at stand still uh, the all the parameters are known to you okay at start we know slip is equal to 1 so if we'll substitute value of slip equal to 1 in this equation number 6 we'll get the starting torque so if we want to calculate starting torque that is t st suffix st that is starting torque it is equal to 3 by 2 pi ns into s will be 1 so 1 into e2 square r2 divided by r2 square plus s will be 1 so simply x2 square so this is the equation of starting torque so now from this equation we can see that the starting torque it is directly proportional to the r2 that is the rotor resistance and we have seen uh, the there are two types of uh, uh, construction of uh, rotors one is wound rotor or uh, slip ring type of uh, rotor and another is squirrel case type of rotor in squirrel case type of rotor 
you cannot add any external resistance so in only uh, slip ring or a wound rotor type of uh, motor you can add the uh, resistance and uh, here you can uh, find that if you are changing the rotor resistance its starting torque will change that is starting torque is directly proportional to this rotor resistance okay so from this we can uh, say that if r2 um, we are varying that is in case of only slip ring or wound type of uh, wound rotor type of induction motors if we are varying the value of r2 we can change its starting torque and uh, this uh, starting torque we cannot change in the case of squirrel cage rotor because we cannot add any external resistance in that okay so this we have already seen so we have to uh, you have to uh, remember these two final expressions of torque as well as starting torque starting torque no need to remember if you will uh, remember only this equation you can substitute the value of s equal to 1 in this equation and you will get the equation of starting torque now what is the condition for maximum torque if we want to find the maximum torque condition for maxima then we know that uh, maxima we can find the if we we'll, uh, take derivation uh, derivative now in this equation of torque that is torque is equal to k into s into e2 square r2 divided by r2 square plus s into x2 whole square in this equation you will find that all the terms are constant except s so that means torque is a function of s k e2 uh, r2 and x2 all these values are constant once the uh, rotor is uh, you have constructed the rotor uh, uh, for a fixed number of poles and Uh, all the values of resistance and all uh, this these parameters k is constant e2 is constant r2 is constant and x2 is constant so torque is only function of this slip s so if we we'll, uh, take derivative of this torque with respect to s and equate it to zero value then we'll get the maxima condition so condition for maximum torque if you want to find uh, maxima of any curve then what you are doing you are differentiating that equation of that curve and with that variable and equating it to zero so here the uh, we are at, uh, uh, taking differentiation of torque uh, equation with respect to the variable s so dt by ds if we we'll equate it to zero we'll get the condition for maxima now you know this torque equation which is function of s at numerator as well as denominator so if you want to take derivative then you have to use u by v formula so u by v formula is v uh, you take keep one constant u into derivative of v minus v into derivative of u that uh, you can do and uh, divided by v square so that will be the uh, formula for u by v uh, derivative so therefore using this formula uh, find dt by ds so dt by ds equal to v uh, sorry u that is numerator so numerator will keep uh, as it is so k into s into e2 square into r2 into derivative of this denominator so with respect to s minus this denominator v will keep it as it is into derivative of the numerator divided by denominator square that is v square this is equal to zero equate it to zero so denominator will you go there so it will be zero so simply uh, there will be this numerator only so keep this as it is k into s into e2 square r2 and derivative of this r2 is constant you have to uh, make uh, so this term will vanish only uh, derivative of this particular term so that is x2 square is constant keep uh, keep it as it is and derivative of s square that is 2 into s so 2 s x2 square 
will be derivative of this minus this term will be as it is r2 square plus s square x2 square so this is as it is and derivative of this simply uh, derivative of this will be 1 into k into e2 square r2 so this we have kept here equal to 0 if we'll expand this you will find that this k into s into e2 square into r2 into 2s x2 square so this s s will be s square so 2 s square k x2 square e2 square r2 so this term will be this minus this r2 square into this so r2 square into k into e2 square into r2 this is one term and minus another term is s square x2 square into this now this is one and this is one same term this is twice and minus one so it will be plus one time k s square x2 square e2 square r2 so this minus this will be only one term remain and this is another term so r2 square k e2 square r2 equal to zero so if um, we'll take uh, k into e2 square into r2 common to this then uh, you will get s square x2 square minus r2 square into bracket k e2 square r2 so these two factors now this term uh, if we are equating it to zero this will directly go to this value and it will become zero so now only this term is there you equate it so it will you will get s square equal to s square x2 square equal to r2 square so s square will be r2 square divided by x2 square so s square is r2 square by x2 square that means s is equal to r2 by x2 if we we'll neglect the negative slip so this is the condition for maximum torque so maximum torque will occur if slip will be equal to r2 by x2 so that's why uh, we can write this S as SM, S suffix M, M, is, M stands for maxima. So maximum, uh, maxima of torque will occur at that slip. So it is SM equal to R2 upon X2. If you will substitute this value of SM in this equation, you will get the value of that maximum torque TM. So T max is equal to this k into s instead of s it will become sm and instead of this s you substitute sm and that sm is nothing but r2 by x2 and rearrange the terms so cancel uh, whichever terms are possible so substitute the value of sm in phi you will get this tm as this substituting the value of sm and then cancelling the terms uh, you will get this tm or the maximum torque value it is equal to k into e2 square divided by 2 x2 newton meter so from this expression what we can say this torque is directly proportional to the rotor uh, um, directly proportional to the square of the induced emf uh, so uh, induced emf at standstill and it is inversely proportional to the rotor reactance. So torque, uh, maximum torque is proportional to 1 upon x2. That means it is inversely proportional to rotor reactance and it is directly proportional to square of the induced EMF at the standstill. Okay. So um, now from this equation, you can see that this maximum torque it is not at all depending on the value of R2. Whereas the starting torque, it is depending on the value of R2. So maximum torque is irrespective of rotor resistance. Whereas the starting torque is directly proportional to the value of R2. So I hope we have to stop here because uh, time is uh, running out. So we'll stop here for uh, today's discussion. I hope uh, you have understood the whatever topics we have covered today.
so we have today we have covered the effect of slip on uh, the various parameters first is rotor frequency then magnitude of rotor induced emf then rotor reactance then rotor impedance rotor power factor and rotor current so in all these um, um, parameters we have calculated the values at stand still and under running condition so under running condition it depends on the value of slip whereas if you will put value of slip uh, in all these equations under running condition as one then you will get all the values of these parameters at stand still condition then after that we have seen the torque equation and uh, from this torque equation we have seen the starting torque equation also so torque equation is uh, torque is uh, equal to uh, this expression and uh, 3 upon 2 pi ns into s e2 square r2 upon r2 square plus s x2 whole square this is for uh, torque and for starting torque you substitute the value of s here as 1 you will get the value of starting torque and then we have calculated the condition for maximum torque so from the torque equation we can see that torque is function of only s that is the variable is only s other terms are the constant so if we we'll take derivative of this torque with respect to s dt by ds and equate it to zero we'll get the um, condition for maxima and from this we got that the condition for maxima is s equal to r2 by x2 after neglecting the negative slip so maximum uh, torque occurs at slip sm so sm equal to r2 by x2 now substitute the value of sm in this equation of torque you will get the value of maximum torque and maximum torque will uh, you will get it as a, a torque is equal to k e2 square by twice x2 so from this equations we can say that maximum torque is directly proportional to square of the uh, induced emf in the rotor at stand still and inversely proportional to the rotor reactance x2 whereas it is irrespective of or it is independent of the rotor resistance r2 whereas the starting torque it is depending on the rotor resistance r2 so that's all friends we'll stop here uh, today's discussion thank you bye good day and take care